Welcome to the podcast, Working. I'm your host, Dan Doriani. The goal of this podcast is to fire the imagination of Christians who long to practice their faith at work. We do this primarily by interviewing people who have a story to tell about the way they practice their convictions as they work. Our guests may be famous or unknown, highly successful or quietly faithful. We meet doctors, athletes, broadcasters, librarians, presidents, intellectuals, politicians, journalists, leaders of startups, and more. This podcast is a production of the Center for Faith and Work St. Louis, which seeks to promote faithfulness in the workplace through education, discipleship, and narratives of believers who apply their faith at work. Today's guest is Shelley Milligan. After a meteoric rise at Washington University, she switched paths and directs the Carver Center of St. Louis. Uh, so good morning, uh, Shelley. Good morning. It's nice to have you on our program. And Thanks. I'm excited Thanks for having you, me. I'm, I'm excited. Sorry to me to talk over you. I'm excited to have you because I've known you for a long time and really like you. But you're also the first person uh, so far that's a manager, a project manager, and a kind of a person that makes the world go round and holds the, the universe together, the human universe together. So, you know, I mean, uh, we, we've had, I've had upfront type people, right? So uh -huh, right. You, know, you have surgeons and they have a team around them and you have uh, people are on TV and there's a team around them and so on. Uh, but you're, you represent the many people that make it work for the, you know, for the more obviously in front of the camera type person. So I'm very glad to have you. Uh, Shelly, you are the managing director of the Carver Project. You want to just spend right. a moment telling us what that means, and then we'll talk about. Well, I'll tell you what. You can tell me about that, and then very much interested in hearing about your prior work at Washington University of St. Louis, one of our nation's great private universities, and also you worked at a Christian school of note, one of the one of our nation's most, um, I don't know, biggest and best run Christian schools, Westminster Christian Academy. So. Uh, I want to hear about all three of them, but let's talk first about the Carver Project. Sure. Well, the Carver Project is a startup Christian ministry. It's a nonprofit. We incorporated back in the fall of 2017. At the time, I was the chair of the board, and I am the Carver Project's only full-time employee. So as managing director, my job is set up to be 50% fundraising and 50% program oversight. So um, it, I like to joke that all jobs have a very large final bullet in the job description that is other duties as assigned. And in this case, <laughs> it's more like all duties. Um, we have a faculty member who is an uh, executive director, but his full-time work is as a professor. And so my job is really to organize the whole enterprise of the nonprofit and to help it be financially sustainable. And the Carver Project's mission is to connect um, the university, church, and society. Um, I think our technical you know, mission statement is to um, empower Christian faculty and students to connect university, church, and society. So we're really thrilled. And personally, for me, I feel like this job um, melds my two big interests and passions in life, which happen to be higher education and Christian faith. Mm -hmm. And so um, I've been with the Carver Project for about a year and a half now, since April of 2019. So um, as, as I think about Carver Project, I see it as um, connecting these uh, lawyers in training and PhDs in engineering and training and so forth uh, to understand how their faith is going to guide them through their career for the next 40 or 50 years with these, you know, brilliant young grad students. Is that right? I, I think that's fair. I, our focus really is faculty, mm -hmm. faculty who are Christians who have decided to um, publicly identify that way at Washington University, which is in some cases, a bit of a risk. Um, Christian faith on a secular campus is not always viewed in a favorable light um, right. with 
within the academy. And so our, our theory, tenure, right? <laughs> especially if you don't have tenure, right? So our, our theory of change and our real sort of biggest asset is the faculty. So yes, we are about training students and helping them see um, how faith would impact their vocation, whether it's, as you said, a lawyer, engineer, a PhD, English student, but really the vehicle for that is Christian faculty as the sort of staying power of a university. Um, students will come and go every four or seven or eight years, but the faculty could be there for 40 or more. And so our goal is to build a community of Christian faculty who are um, sort of bonded in this group together, but also able to have a ministry uh, as part of their vocation as a professor. So part of their research, teaching, scholarship. Yeah, um, yeah to be able yeah. to have an outlet there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is, uh, you say you've been at this for about 18 months and you've right. done other things. At an right. early age, I'm gonna, you can correct me or streamline this, but uh, you're kind of the chief of staff for the person who wasn't called the president, but they were actually, operationally speaking, they were the president of Washington University, and you were kind of their uh, chief of staff, the person who ran things for them at a pretty early age. How did that happen? Right. Um, you know, I was working at Washington University in fundraising, and boy, that is a huge operation and an incredibly successful one. Um, a very uh, large group of people and, um, you know, just, just a a really sophisticated enterprise raising billions of dollars. I did that for about a year and a couple of months. And then um, the Dean of Arts and Sciences was uh, sort of my, you know, the, the administrator I work with most frequently and his name was Ed Macias. And um, we just worked together really well. So he ended up asking if I would um, consider joining his office as assistant dean. And so I did in part, my job was to liaise with the Office of Alumni and Development because it was so big and arts and sciences was so big and hard for each to know um, who was on the other side, who they should be interacting with, and then to do some other work as well. So I think how it happened is that I ended up working really well with another person whose you know, work style was compatible with mine, or maybe I learned his enough to be able to complement it well. And then we just kind of went from there. So I ended up working with Ed for quite a long time as Dean. And then he became provost of WashU. Um, which is de facto the president, you might say. Yeah. Which is, yeah, sort of the chief academic officer, right? right? So, yeah, we had a pretty lean operation um, at the time. It's a little bit bigger now. I think if you were to look at a, you know, a research university like WashU, the provost office is usually pretty big. Ours was really small in comparison. So at the time, um, yeah, I sort of helped keep the trains running and had a few, um, you know, oversaw some areas, but it was, yeah. it was wonderful. Yeah. Well, also working on a PhD of your own on, right. uh, you know, women in academic leadership, if I recall correctly. Right. You and got it. Yep. So you had a pretty busy life helping, helping run the provost's office and getting a PhD simultaneously. That's, that's quite a task, but, um, I'm kind of. I want to make sure we say it, it was just an ED. It's not Justin, but it was an EDD, yeah. which is an educational doctorate, right? So yeah, it's slightly different from a PhD. People, people yeah. that know have. Yeah, amazing. I understand. I just don't uh, want to okay. be in 20 years. Someone say, "Oh, Shelly said she got a PhD and she didn't." You know that happens. Yeah, we well, could blame it <laughs> yeah. on the interviewer, but uh, it's important. My my rule of thumb on this is that um, the degree to which people insist on being called doctor is inversely proportional to their confidence in their degree. So right. if you, uh, if you are, I hardly ever use it. Yeah. yeah. Right. If you're insisting, <laughs> oh no, don't call me doctor. Then it means in my book, it means that you're very confident uh, as to who you are and you're confident in your skin, which I think is great. But yes, an ED is right. not quite the same as a PhD. It's not certainly not inconsequential by any means. Right. So well done. Um, so yeah, you, um, you know, you just touched on something I think is so important and I like to talk about in this in this uh, podcast, and that is how do you get into the position you have and to what extent? So, you know, you've kind of bounced, if I may say it that way, or, or yeah. boggled or switched between general administration 
and specifically fundraising. Now they're connected, of course, but they're not identical by any means. No. And uh, you have certain skills that, that seem to work in both enterprises. Um, yeah. So maybe just tell me about that. What's it like to switch more or less, but not totally between mm -hmm. organizing in general, which you've done a couple of times and fundraising, which you've done a couple of times. Yeah, well, I think it, de it depends a little bit on the size of the organization where you're working. Right. So at Wash U, you have a huge operation in all senses of the word. And so jobs can be really specified and narrow. And um, if you're a fundraiser, you're a fundraiser. And that's pretty much, you know, your how you live and breathe. And when you work for a startup with one employee full time, <laughs> you end up doing um, a little bit of everything. And both are great. I mean, I, I have to say fundraising is one of those um, professions that no one thinks about. You don't go to college and take a class in it. You don't major in development or even know what that word means. Maybe, you know, like professional development or right. adolescent development, but right. um, fund development is nothing that you think about and nor probably should you. But the truth is that no matter where you go to college or even some private schools and even to a degree now public schools, there's a usually a whole operation that mm -hmm. exists to ensure financial sustainability and um, offsets your tuition, at least in some part by fundraising. And so really no one thinks about fundraising as a profession. And yet there's a huge demand for it. Uh, you know, nationwide for sure, and even beyond, um, depending on how, you know, education is funded in other countries differently. But um, certainly it's a huge and very lucrative financial, um, financially, uh, it, fundraisers are among the, you know, uh, raise, they raise a lot of money and their skill set is really prized. And because there is such demand and so few, the economic laws mean that they get paid really well. So mm -hmm. I feel like um, that skill set is pretty unique, and um, it's also one that people um, sort of really shrink back from and don't seem to want to learn. So when you say, oh, I raise money, people say, oh, I could never do that. And I always think, I'm not a brain surgeon here. This is not that difficult. But I think there's also an intersection of where you're gifted or sort of called, it doesn't feel like work as much to you. So I recognize that, but I also think there's a great perception problem with um, maybe problems too strong, but there's a perception that fundraisers are, I don't know, just in the category that tends to- Yeah, I mean- have it's, some uh, derision I'll, sometimes. I'll, I'll, maybe I'll say it for you because I've been on both sides. You know, I get, it's Christmas time. Yeah. And so I'm getting, <clears throat> Everything that I'm sending uh, lots to you. Of emails yeah. Every day. Can you give this organization yes. to it? You are, you know, faintly connected. You know, I'm yes. on email list somehow because, you know, right. my daughter drove through their campus 12 years ago. <laughs> right. So I'm I'm therefore on the sort of alumni list. Um, on the other hand, I've also done fundraising and it's never been my main job, but I was a pastor, and so pastors right. always sure. uh, you know doing some level, it may be two hours a week at most, right. but they're doing it. And I've sort of gotten into it by accident, more or less. Uh, and so fundraising is one of those areas that is viewed as onerous by a lot of people because, oh, I got a letter from one of those fundraisers. But on the yeah. other hand, it's a huge service, right? Because right. people want to give their money away. <clears throat> Pardon me. They want to give their money away well and to right. causes that matter. <clears throat> and and people who've, um, you know, who've become prosperous especially and have their basic needs met uh, right. want want to give to causes that will make a lasting difference well and we're also favor when you we're called to do that as believers whether we're prosperous or not right i mean it's yeah, a right. commandment and not, yeah. you know not commandment but you know we're we're encouraged to do that and i i've thought a lot about this because i did not grow up you know, I went to school on a Pell Grant and um, we certainly had enough, but I didn't, I'd like to tell people all the time, I, I didn't realize I was middle class or less than until I went to college when I saw this just incredible wealth, um, you know, all around me. And right. I've thought about it a lot, you know, th there's this, you know, with money or something else, when you find the exact right 
present to give to someone. Mm. There's this deep joy and satisfaction in knowing that you got it right. You found a way to bless that person Mm -hmm. with a gift, whatever it was, whether it was a, you know, a necklace or a book or a, an experience with you, you, you found an exact match that, that maybe someone else couldn't have found. And there's right. great joy in that and mm-hmm. more joy maybe in the giving than the receiving. And I think mm-hmm. to me as a fundraiser, that's what I'm about is helping people find that sweet spot. And even if it's not with my organization, now this is a little, and I think this is where faith comes in is to say, if you don't give to the Carver Project, how can I help you find a, a destination for what you have, right. whether it's your money or your time or your talent that could really be a blessing to you, but also to others. That's yeah. kind of, uh, you know, and of course, as Christians, we trace this back to Jesus who, you know, I, I think about all the time, you know, we talk about Jesus at, in December here as the perfect gift to us, but imagine from his perspective, the deep satisfaction and knowing that he is the gift and that he is the, that perfect match. I mean, there's great just contentment and peace there that I think is worth um, fostering in a way. And, it, you know, this is what... <laughs> that doesn't usually happen in a letter or an email. And so I have really been fortunate to work at institutions that have believed in personal relationship um, building in terms of fundraising. And that's, that's just the gravy and just a real privilege and honor to be part of actually. Um, So let me just go back to uh, development and your comment that not many kids, you didn't say it this way, but not many 12 year olds or 14 year olds think of development. But uh, one reason why this is of interest to me, and then we'll, we'll switch over to something else in a minute, but sure. it is the way in which people sort of grope to find their calling. Mm-hmm. And what people often have is a skill set. They're not exactly aware of, of what that skill set is. So you have to, you do things, and then people put mm-hmm. you in charge of things or ask you to do things. And then they say, oh, would you do that again? Um, right. Do that again. Could I train you so you could do even better? Because, you know, the people who are older and more experienced, um, are always, everybody's a talent scout. All leaders are talent scouts. And so they're looking at young Shelly Milligan when you're, you know, 25 years old or something. And they're saying, oh, Shelly could do this, which you're completely unaware of, uh, even a career path. Um, But I see things like, um, you know, you're just very friendly, you're positive, you're energetic, you're very relational, you remember things. You know, if, if you know something about my family, you're apt to ask me about it, you know, seven years later, like who on earth remembers this? Well, Shelly right. remembers this. And yeah. so that's, you know, that's what it takes uh, for development, but also for administration. I mean, mm-hmm. you remember that somebody told you a while ago, some life situation and they acted in a strange way. You said, oh, it's because of this, that right. that's happening in their life. And that makes you a good manager of people that you also were not just a development officer. Um, so development has that, you know, uh, soft skills, hidden skills, unknown skills right. that somebody helps you uncover. Right. And, uh, you know, fun, what you're trying to do and what a lot of us want to do is, is get money to the right places right? where it'll make a difference. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I think, um, you know, I, your point is really well taken about knowing other people. I mean, I think at the end of the day, people talk about fundraising as an art and a science, and there's certainly lots of science. You can run spreadsheets. You can know when someone usually makes a gift. You can know what kind of stock they like to transfer. I mean, you can know all these things, but um, if it's not the right time to ask, you need to pick that up in a way that is artful and that listens well and cares about the person. And I think those skills are easy to me and um, work well. And I think it may have start, you know, I, how did I become a, I mean, truly, if you want to know the truth in college, there were jobs on campus dialing for dollars. <laughs> I was in college in the mid nineties and, you know, nobody had a cell phone yet. And that was how we re- reached right. people. And so I was a junior in college and I thought I need to make, 
a little bit more money and mm -hmm. I started to call some alums and believe it or not, one of my first calls, I reached this guy and he was on one of the earliest cell phones ever. This would have been in the mid nineties. And we were talking, you know, you're supposed to establish a rapport. So I'm, you know, I'm Shelly, I'm an English and French major, blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden the call dropped. And oh. this is not part of what was in our training. So okay. I sat there thinking, what do I do? Do I call him back? I'm a student at a school and he's not home. And so I did, I called him back and I apologized. And he said, oh, that's okay. I'm, it's my fault. I'm at, I'm at the grocery store in the cereal aisle. And I thought to myself, <laughs> I mean, now this is very common for us now. We can right. buy Cheerios and talk to whomever, but in right. 1995, it was not. And I remember thinking, right. where's my script for this? I don't, yeah. I don't have, you know, if he says this, then I say that, like there was nothing. And I, I said, you know, I think I just said, well, what kind of cereal are you buying? And so then we were talking <laughs> about cereal and, and he said, are you calling me to make a gift? And it was perfect because I didn't have yes. to say, I and mean, I'm thinking to myself, how do I turn this conversation right. from golden grams to $25 to Washington and Lee? And he did it for me. And I found that, you know, one of my big secrets about fundraising is if you do it right, it often takes care of itself. And yes. so in that sense, I could just say, well, actually, yes, I am calling. Would you, you know, would you be interested in considering a gift? And he made one and, mm -hmm. you know, I got to ding the bell and that was a great, you know, sort of high, but I think the, the bigger story around it is that call did not go according to plan. Right. Um, and they never do because there isn't a plan really. Right. There's some science behind a plan, but there's the art of, uh, do I call the guy back? Do we talk about cereal? Do I just get on my way? And tell them why I'm whatever. Yeah. And so I think, you know, some of, some of figuring out your calling is practicing and sort of trying it. And if it seems to work, even if it's serendipitous, you might say, I think, I think, you know, you have a, a, we've talked about this a little bit before is, you know, what role does apparent serendipity, which of course we know isn't really right. serendipity, but you know, does that play versus true preparation? It's obviously right. both, but yeah. 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 So I've learned in, in my very limited work in fundraising, what I've learned is, uh, number one, I'm very bad. I, I'm very awkward at asking for money. But I've, I've learned that if people want to talk to me for no apparent reason, um, it's either because they've got a significant personal issue, they need some guidance about something, which is the more common. But, um, you know, maybe one time out of seven when somebody, or 20, I don't know. But once in a while, when somebody says, hey, I want to talk to you, and they don't want to say what it is. What they want to do is give money away and they're yeah. trying to do it well. And so yeah. you're trying to serve them. And exactly as you said earlier, um, it may not be your, your organization at all. In fact, one right. of my favorite conversations on the topic of faith and work is with a man who, um, who was uh, a financial manager. He is my financial manager. He's still under 40. And uh -huh. his first difficult client was also his first big client. And uh -huh. And it was a couple with no children and they were going to give all their money to Planned Parenthood when they, when they left this world. And uh, he was profoundly um, distressed over that, but he couldn't say no. He wasn't allowed by his company to say no. All he could do is hand it over to somebody else. And then they would still do what they were going to do. And so he ended up talking to me and what, uh, what we decided in the end, or I coached him, I guess you could say, was uh, that he would ask, why do you want to give all your money to Planned Parenthood? And, you know, I want to help women in need. And, okay, there's a lot of women in need. There's a lot of reasons for people to be in need besides an unplanned pregnancy. And, uh, you know, so there's education mm -hmm. deficits, there's poverty, there's job training needs. And, you know, he presented all these options and, and uh, it was a couple, but the woman was kind of the leader in the process. And she said, oh, thank you for giving me the, all these other ways to help women. Um, and, you know, some of the money still did go to Planned Parenthood sure. and it wasn't a tiny amount of money, but he helped her give money better, yep. which was, but I'm going to move on from, uh, I didn't, okay. you know, these conversations go wherever they go, but no, I know, yeah. we'll move on from, from fundraising, lest somebody think we've got a fixation on this or something. Um, so let me go back to the question of finding your calling. So, you know, if somebody's a singer, 
they probably always wanted to sing. They were in a children's choir, you know, and they were the star of the children's choir. If someone's a professional athlete, they were probably the best, you know, best kid in the school right. at sports way back when. That's not the way it is with administration. You know, the, the, the right. child who's, you know, 10 or 15, who's going to be a project manager, which is largely what you are and always have been. Uh -huh. I mean, you've focused on funding, but you've also organized lots sure. of other things. Yep. Um, that's It's not obvious where that comes from. So let me ask it to you this way. How much would you say of what you do is, is an innate gift and it just had to flourish? And how much, how much of it is uh, just hard work um, yep. and a willingness to do a job that was handed to you, uh, sort of being in the right place at the right time? Mm -hmm. Where does that fit in it? And then I'll just tell you in advance that I'm going to ask you in a moment after you answer this. Um, you're a single woman. And, uh, you know, a lot of times the view is only single women can really rise to positions, you know, of leadership in a hurry. But yes. uh, we'll come to that in a minute. If you, I want okay. you to know in advance that that's coming. Okay, thanks. Um, so the first question has to do with is gifting more innate or is it hard work and or, or what combination? Um, and specifically with administration, you know, if I were to look back on high school, I, you know, I was part of a, I was a Girl Scout, which I did not tell anybody at the time, okay. um, because it was sort of embarrassing. Mm -hmm. um, but I was part of a really active troop that did a trip a, a month. And so September was sailing and October was hiking and I don't know, all these different things. And it was um, a lot of camping, which I find kind of funny now, because that does not appeal in the least. But anyway, I ended up being, I don't know what the title was, but I was in charge of my Girl Scout troop. And I was also president of my youth group. So if I look back, I think even right. early on, as you know, in high school, there were chances to lead that I so, took. And yeah. I'm not sure that I wanted them, but they were, I, I don't remember if, if I they was motivated you. to Yes, I, somehow I ended up doing it. And what I want to say about that, and it relates to your next question, is that I think what I learned is that I could do it mm -hmm. and that I was, I had somewhere the skill set, um, even if it wasn't fully developed. And so it led me to accept the opportunities when they presented themselves. Yeah. And, you know, I did want to do some activities in college that I was, that I didn't, you know, that did not accept me. I remember in particular, you know, it's whatever, different things that you, I'm not the girl that got everything she always wanted to do. Right. So um, anyway, I, I do think there's some, there, there's a lot of hard work, but I do think there's some recognition. And I think there's also a leadership vacuum in lots of ways, especially in the academy. I mean, there's right. just Everybody you know, wants to be a teacher. Somebody has to organize it. Yeah. And I mean, I've done enough study of universities that, you know, faculty used to do everything. You used to teach philosophy and then you would in the afternoon be the admissions person. And mm -hmm. but because, you know, the business of higher education has exploded in our country, at least there's a whole professional class now that kind of administers the university mm -hmm. so that the faculty can teach. And mm -hmm. that is there are pros and cons to that. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think, you know, there's, uh, there has to be a willingness to try something that you aren't completely sure you're qualified for. And can, can I just, pause, tells, can I just pause? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh -huh. I want to make sure everybody heard that you have to be willing to try something that you're not necessarily qualified for. That is absolutely correct. And very important. If you're searching for a career you have to be willing to try things. You're probably not qualified, certainly, you know, not fully qualified, maybe barely qualified, which is right. general intelligence and a good work ethic. Yeah. I just had to single that out. That's a great point. Well, I think it's especially important because that goes against every part of us, probably. I mean, every part of me wants to be competent, qualified, effective, efficient, like know exactly that it's going to work if I do Mistakes. it. And Right. I, I, I mean, I've never been a managing director of a startup before. I'm terrified. I'm not, I'm not qualified to do this job. Do I have some past experiences that sort of relate? I do. Mm -hmm. um, and here's where I think 
for the believer, faith can be really helpful because if you look in the Bible, hardly anybody was qualified to do what God qualified them to do. I mean, Moses, whatever, we can just go on forever with this. And I think it's the story of scripture is that God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. And that's a cheesy Christian cliche, but we believe it because we've seen it to be true. I have. And it also is a huge dose of humility to know I don't have all these answers here. And the trick is figuring out when to admit that I don't know the answer and when to fake it and learn it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I remember um, when I was early in fundraising, I had just graduated a few years and I met with this CEO and um, asked him, you know, about his college time. And he said, oh, he said, I was in a fraternity and I was drunk three quarters of my college career. And I thought, this is not my experience, even a little bit. I was, you know, studying and, and he said, I made a 2.0 and I was lucky to get that. He said, I hire all the people like you that had a 4.0 and I'm, (laughs) you know, feeling pretty small at this moment. And he said, the truth is I was so hungover most of the time. I'm not advocating his way of life, but he, what he said was really, I thought profound. He said, I'm not advocating being drunk all the time. He said, but it forced me to realize there was a big difference between answering a question honestly and saying I had no idea Mm -hmm. and trying to fake it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, and he said, this is, this is what I do all day in business. And I mean, I don't know if he's right or not. I've never been in business, but there is a truth to the sentence, you know, to the, to the, the idea that sometimes you need to admit I actually don't know the answer to that. I need to get back to you. Let me do some research or what do you think versus let me talk this out and maybe I'll get there because lots of times you do get there and your past experiences can help you, you know, in your current moment of, of need. Um, So let me, uh, let me see if I can comment on two, two threads that you've been mentioning. So on the one hand, we know that God calls the foolish the weak and the powerless. That's First Corinthians chapter twelve, and that's that's what he calls himself. He doesn't generally call, you know, the generals and the captains of industry. He calls the weak and the foolish, which were at the time ninety-seven percent of all the people in the Roman right. Empire would have qualified as weak and foolish and powerless. So of course, God mostly called the weak and the foolish and the powerless. And and you yep. know, we want to make it very clear that, uh, for example, yeah. Paul had friends in Caesar's household, and he had. When he was in Ephesus, sure. the rulers of the city were his friends and protected yep. him. And we're not anti-elite, uh, but that God doesn't, you know, focus on the elites of the world the way we sometimes do. So on the yeah. one hand, he calls and qualifies the weak and the foolish. On the other hand, we're supposed to recognize that he gives us gifts. I mean, that's also yes. profoundly, you know, stated in a way yeah. through the whole chapters of 1 Corinthians, Romans 12. But I'm going to just quote something, and I'm going to quote it because the uh, the way the ESV uh, renders it is so um, is so obtuse that, uh-huh. that kind of makes you think, and it's it's uh, Luke chapter twelve verse forty eight, and uh, I love the ESV in general, but um, it's just the way it's stated is is so unlike ordinary English that it forces yeah. contemplation, which I think is good. So uh, Jesus says, but uh, <laughs> everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. Uh-huh. Everyone to whom much was right. given of him, much will be required. Yes. So you have to think about that because it's so unusual as an English construction. And we turn around and say, okay, if God gave you a lot, he expects a lot. That's yep. what it, that's what it amounts to. Sure. And then uh, he goes on to say, and the second part is a little bit, and from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. So yeah. again, if you've been given a lot of gifts, God yes. expects a lot from you. Yep. Um, and, and you're one of those people that I think has to walk uh, between the two, right? Because no one, you didn't get a degree in management or running, you know, running yeah. a startup. Uh, and so in a sense, you could say, well, he called me, I'm weak and foolish. On the other right. hand, you're a highly intelligent person, you have yeah. a lot of energy, uh, yeah. and you have very high uh, social skills, which yeah. are important for your work. And so he's entrusted a lot to you and you have to do a lot with it, which you're trying I, to yeah. do. That's at, right. You know, at Westminster and at Wash U and at the Carver Project. So that's that's, that's a right. state, not a question, but I'll let you bounce off it. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And I'm 
I'm the first person to say, you know, I think developing the, the gifts and the skills that you have is, is really important. And that's, you know, sort of why we're here as believers. And for me, I've been given amazing educational experiences. But you're also different... really smart. Can I just, I'll just say that. So. Well, thanks. <laughs> um, I don't think I would have, uh, yeah, I, I definitely sense gifting and, and sort of learning and knowing um, I definitely, you know, belong in that kind of a space that, that mm -hmm. just works well for me and, right. you know, feeds my soul. Um, but you're right. It does mean that you need to do something with it. And I, I'm, you know, in the last probably decade, I've been even more aware of how everything in my life has set me up for privilege in a way that not everyone has. And so I think there's, you know, an opportunity to grow your gifting, but there's also a responsibility to make sure others know that they have some too. Mm -hmm. um, part of what my dissertation research showed me was that, you know, we haven't gotten to the gender question yet, but I studied women who were college and university presidents. Mm -hmm. And in particular, I looked at women who were their institution's first female president. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and looked at institutional culture and their leadership style and how those two intersected. And one of the unexpected findings was that because women are so underrepresented in the academy and truthfully everywhere um, in terms of leadership, mm -hmm. um, the power of a male colleague um, encouraging and calling out leadership behaviors in those women presidents was extremely important mm -hmm. to their career path. So someone saying, hey, I, I really see leadership skills in you. You should try to be, you know, you should think about being the chair of the French department. Right. And um, someone That's in my life saying, starting point yeah, you want to do other things. Right. And so Ed saying to me, you know, Shelly, I you know, I remember saying to him when he invited me to be assistant dean, I remember saying, I don't really have the qualifications here. And he said, um, you're not afraid of anyone. Mm -hmm. And that was really telling because that, you know, for him, it was important. And, and you know, in, in university settings, and, and maybe this is business too, you know, people that are really good at what they do are really good at what they do. And sometimes they know it. And if, you know, you just sort of need to be able to hang with that. Mm -hmm. Another dean at the time told me, um, Shelly, we don't need another Navy blazer around this table. When I said, I'm not really the best person for this job, which is, nope. yes, yeah, not the way to approach right. a position of leadership to sort of declare yourself unqualified. But I, <laughs> I think that was a real uh, lesson for me was the value of difference. Right. Um, or perceived difference. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm actually not really that different, right? I mean, I have advanced degrees. I've grown up in, in, on college campuses. I know how administration works, but my perspective was different. I was a woman at the time I was young. I didn't have a doctorate yet. And his point was, we don't need any of that. We need you to be who you are, mm -hmm. which is not who I am. And um, there's a ton of that. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of science research that shows the value of, you know, heterogeneous groups um, and, yeah. uh, you know, lots of business literature that'll tell you the same thing in a boardroom or, you know, for leadership. So let me pick up on another thread. Um, and uh, so I'm just going to make a comment. And that is yeah. that one of the most common commands in the Bible is fear not or don't be afraid. Yes. And another of the right. most common commandments is be afraid. <laughs> right. Be very afraid. Fear the Lord and, and so forth. Yes. And you said, you know, you're not fearless. And yet you're implying that you were maybe not fearful of this, but you were, you know, you had some misgivings about it. So I'll just, I'll go personal here yeah. for a second. Um, so I have one of my joys in life right now is I have grandchildren and my oldest grandchild is now seven. And she was, their family was uh, the Christmas, you know, read the Christmas uh, readings and light the candle in church uh, this last Sunday. Uh -huh. And so mom, you know, reads and dad reads and she read what she'd more or less memorized from Luke chapter two. And, um, and I was there, I mean, we go to the same church and 
uh, her, you know, her voice that, you know, a child's voice can be so clear and pure and, and uh, a child with good elocution seems to have perfect elocution. And it was just perfect. And, you know, they came over, the kids came over to our house a little bit later. And I said, so um, you did a great job reading the Bible and reciting. And, and uh, how did that feel to you? Were you calm or were you afraid? She said, oh, Papa, I was so afraid. I was so frightened. And I said, well, why? She said, all those people looking at me. And I said, yeah, but uh, you didn't let it stop you. you mm. It didn't show. Right. And she kind of looked at her eyes, just got big. Is uh -huh. She understood that immediately. She comprehended yeah. the difference between having a strong fear and being paralyzed by that fear and having a strong yes. fear and, and still proceeding to right. do what you need to do. And yep. you know that where it says in the Bible, fear not, a lot of times it's somebody who has a reason to be afraid. Yep. You know, they're going to battle. They've got a terrible adversary. You know, their life is in danger. Yes. And they're told to fear not, be strong, be courageous. I'm the Lord. I'm with you. Maybe I'm, I'm here, yes. you know, Deuteronomy, end of Deuteronomy, yeah. and Joshua, where I think fear not shows up about nine times. Um, so it's not denying, it's not saying fear is evil. It's saying you can be afraid and proceed. Yes. And, and you should proceed. I mean, right. only a fool is unafraid before going into battle. That's right. right. So, or speaking in front of the whole church when you're seven. <laughs> or speak in front of the whole church when you're seven. Or uh, start functioning as the assistant dean to the provost when you have no training whatsoever. Right. On the other hand, people you trust. It's not anybody That's telling right. you to do this. It's people right. you trusted yes. telling you you could do this. There's a huge yes. difference between people telling you can do things and people who know you and people whom yes. you trust telling. That's you so know. right. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. singleness, um, I, I think mm -hmm. of, um, you know, the single women I know and the married women I know and uh, the women that I know who, who rose pretty high in a hurry in hard work, very talented uh, people like you. There's a lot of very talented women, of course, and a fair number of them who, who rose, you know, maybe to be a vice president at an early age in a you know, significant corporation are either single or they married a little bit later. Um, yep. So I'm not going to try to ask you to speak for all women everywhere, or single women or anything like Thank that. But just give yeah. me a thought or two about um, yeah. being single and a woman of, uh, of skill and in a leadership position. Yes. Um, yeah. And thanks for recognizing I can't speak for them all. I, I do see this. Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a pickle, you know, that, um, let me just say that I think women, whether they're single or married, single or married or single again, or whatever the situation have the same, in my view, um, giftings as men to be able to be leaders in business and, you know, higher ed and lots of contexts. Um, I think the real issue is perception. Mm. um, by others and maybe, um, not even just men in this case, I think women perceive women differently too. When I, you know, had my first promotion, all of a sudden I was in charge of, you know, managing people. And one of the women that I would be overseeing was, you know, in her sixties. And she flat out told me that she didn't like women bosses. Okay. So, which of course, don't understand sometimes. Startling, yeah, right. I mean, it was it was really telling. But I had never been a boss. I was a woman, but I mean, other than that, that was to me. It just struck me as a really dumb statement mm. um, because she never had me as a boss. And at right. that time, I didn't know who I would be. And certainly, I'm not perfect. But right. my point is that there are lots of perceptions, and one of them is that because women are single, they have more ability to focus or more time to focus on their career. And I, you know, if we were to look objectively, that's probably true, but I don't think that's limiting in a way. I, I feel like women who are married and have children are some of the most focused employees mm -hmm. because they have to be, um, right. you know, and, and because God has gifted them that way. Mm -hmm. um, we would never say to a man, you shouldn't be married or right. you shouldn't have a family. In fact, both of those things are expected and prized. 
-hmm. It's only for women that it becomes a limiting factor. And Mm -hmm. so there's something very wrong about that. And I think it's cultural. I think it's structural. I think it's just sort of been. Um, Having said that, I will say, because I'm not married and I don't have children of my own, I definitely see that I have more time and, um, you know, space maybe to consider work. And I think about it, my mind drifts there, you know, in the shower when it could drift to a child if mm-hmm. I had one. And so um, it, it, it I understand. Force themselves on you by banging on the door. <laughs> yes, right. Exactly, exactly. Right. Um, and, and maybe that's part of why I sought out Young Life for so long was mm-hmm. to have something else because truly at the end of the day, your identity does not rest in right. your work. Um, that doesn't mean it's not important and that it doesn't fulfill a very important and even divine sacred purpose. We believe that. Right. But at the end of the day, your business card is not your definition. And I never right. wanted it to be that way, even as I might have had titles that would tempt me um, mm-hmm. there. And so I, I don't know, it's sort of frustrating as I look around. And sometimes I even think that. Um, you know, women end up believing that perception about themselves because that's what people say to them. Oh, that's so great. I'm glad that you have, you know, and, and there's just, um, I think that's an excuse that, you know, lots of people take that's probably not all the way healthy all the time, which is not to say, you know, I'm a huge fan of stay at home moms and God calls people in different seasons to different purposes. And, and even I think single women, are called to times of not work. I think, um, you know, it's, it's one of the biggest frustrations that I have. And this happens in the church too. Like, Oh, let's, let's ask a single woman to do that. Mm -hmm. She doesn't have anything else to do. Well, that's, that's it's not true because among other things (laughs) in a marriage, I mean, you know, there are certain things I do that my wife, Debbie does not have to worry about because I'm good at them. And there are other things that I, and they might be things ordinarily associated with males for that matter. That's right. But, you know, she's, she's better at plumbing than I am. And she also likes plumbing and I don't. So I don't have to worry That's about awesome. ineptitude yeah. as a plumber because not only does she, she's good at it and she likes it. So she likes it. Right. <laughs> so That's right. I, in a, an important way, single people have less time uh, than married people because they have to do everything. You know, you don't That's have right. that division of labor. Well, that's yes. a good point. That's Thanks. So um, so I want to go to my rapid fire questions, if I may. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, so rapid fire question number one, and you know, you and I, one of the things you and I, oh, I got to say one more thing. I just love, you know, I think you and I first talked way back when about Young Life and you, right. you know, I was your pastor and you brought about, I don't know, seven teenage girls to church with yes. you. It's like, Hey Dan, I want you to meet uh-huh. my friends. And yep. I just love how you always um, are looking for a way to keep your um, your multiple interests and skills going. And yep. your desire to connect to people, of course, leads you in work. But it also led you to Young Life, which yep. was uh, such a joy for you for so long. So I just want to commend you for that. And, yes, thank you. And I, I was love, always going to see mm-hmm. a posse of young, uh, young teenage girls with you on Sundays. Um, Thanks. so you and I share, um, a love of side projects. That's what I was saying. Um, but we also share a disdain for what's your favorite questions. Like what's your favorite food? Well, like right. what month is it? You know, right. uh, what, what's, what fresh fruits out? Um, and so we yeah. don't like the question, what's your favorite book? So I'm not going to ask that. I used mm-hmm. to ask it. I don't ask it anymore. Now I ask, what book do you most, so these are rapid fire. You can't give long answers. These are like, okay. Um, what yep. book do you most like to give to your friends in the hopes that it will enrich them or strengthen them? What's a book? You can even mention two, but what's what's a book or two you love to give away to your friends or tell them to read? Well, I read a ton and uh, it depends on the friend, which book I give sure. them. But one of my favorites in the last five or so years is a book by an author called Richard Rohr. He's a Christian mystic, which is not a tradition I know anything yeah. about really, but it's called Falling Upward. Mm-hmm. And I discovered it uh, about six or seven, six years ago, and it's excellent. And I think would be great for your listeners. It talks about our lives as really being, um, having two halves, but mm-hmm. they're not necessarily chronological. And right. so he talks about the first half is kind of 
who am I, accumulation, understanding, knowledge, experiences. And then the second half, um, usually inaugurating because of some major life event that happens to you, usually not of your choosing. Right. After which you have a choice. You can continue in first half of life approach or you can choose second half of life approach. And of course, his description in the book is the second half and how falling upward is um, a general sense of the Lord wanting you to fall his direction mm -hmm. um, and sort of create maybe a life that looks very different than the first half, whether or not that's chronological. Okay, I um, so tell you, that's you, did a, you did a really bad job of giving me a 30 second answer. But yeah, you took a good answer. So I like your book. You, you told me I could have two books, but I just picked one and went <laughs> longer on it. You picked one and gave me a precy. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, what I do you, you do? To read it. Well, you've told me about this book before, actually. Um, okay. I haven't read it yet, but I think um, See? maybe I will. Um, I would You're probably would, but my list of books to read is. Yeah, I know. Is, I, I'm taking you seriously. I'm just not going to make a promise. I might not be able to keep. Uh -huh. What do you do to play or relax? Yeah, I love to be outside. So okay. I take a walk almost every morning. I love to play tennis. Mm -hmm. I do love to read. Um, yeah. My roommate and I like to do puzzles together, jigsaw okay. puzzles, certain kind of puzzle that's achievable, not yeah, the right. really hard ones like that are all blue. Um, yes, that's a nightmare. Exactly. So, 2,000 yeah. pieces, black and white zebras in the savannah. Yeah, no. No, thank right. you. Okay. Uh, if you could do anything for one year, practical considerations aside, uh, what would you do? You know, I love to learn things and one year is a, a huge gift. So I would do almost anything. Really, well, it just depends pick on. One. Pick one. I know I don't want to pick any. It <laughs> depends on who I'm doing it with. I need okay. to do it with a person that I like and respect and can learn uh, from. But I'll do anything anywhere. Really? I don't probably want to do physics. Yeah, but other than that, I'm pretty open. Garbage collection. Garbage collection. Yes. Do, that, do yeah. you know what? Do you know <clears throat> what happens with garbage? You put all your worst stuff on the curb, <laughs> and it goes away. Someone yeah, takes amazing. it. Yeah. I mean, it smells bad. There are bugs in there. Yeah. And someone takes it away. Uh, yes, yeah. I would do garbage collection. I think you yeah. would learn a lot. I think I don't know that I would love it, but yeah, I think right. I would do it. My uh, one of my questions when we get to elitist is if all the politicians and all the garbage collectors disappeared from the world at the same moment, who would we miss more? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, they're the garbage collector, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, yeah. we, not to put down politicians, but, uh, you know, yeah. in the short run, certainly. We would okay, be I have panic. an answer. I just thought of it because I sort of punted. But you know what I would love to do is work in a bookstore for a year. Okay. How fun okay. would that be? Yeah. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. That's good. I accept that. All right. Um, if people want to know more about your work, they can go to the Carver Project website, right? Yes, yeah. definitely go there. CarverSTL.org. Okay. And there's videos, there's blogs. It's mm -hmm. such a fun way to see what a group of Christians who are faculty members are doing. We have a podcast um, where we interview Christian faculty, both at Wash U, but also across the country and hear about their work, but also their faith and how those yeah. intersect. It's, it's really fun. Yeah. Go to the website or you can email me. I'm happy to get okay. coffee with anyone. Yeah. yeah great. Um, uh, my last question is, who should I interview next? Mm. Mm. Well, I think you should interview a, a faculty member. Okay. At a secular university. Okay. And hear how God calls them to their work. I think faculty are among the most misunderstood um professions. I think lots of people think, oh, they teach two hours a week and they do nothing else. And there's so much else. And so right. I'm, I'm a big fan of disrupting those perceptions. And so I would say pick a faculty member and it doesn't have to be, you know, it might well, even you know be fun to. I actually have two faculty members on my list um, for, you know, the next handful. So we're, we're in good shape. And yeah. you and I may even have one of the same people in mind, but I'll save that. For okay. Them. Yeah. Sounds um, good. Shelly, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank Same. you. For Thanks for having me. Your experience, your sense of your calling and of self, a lot of great uh, pieces of wisdom for people who may be in a position kind of like yours. So thanks I for I hope that. so. It's been great. Bye. Thanks, Dan.
If you have enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and rate us on your preferred podcast platform. You can visit our website, the Center for Faith and Work St. Louis at faithandworkstl.org. There you can subscribe to our podcast, sign up for our newsletter, learn about our faith and work cohorts, leave a message for us, and more. Here are the questions for the podcast with Shelley Milligan. Do you have the experience of God calling you outside of your comfort or qualification zone? What was that like? What do you think of Shelley's point that with privilege come both opportunities and responsibilities? Join our discussion at facebook.com slash faithandworkstl or our Instagram at faithandworkstl. I'm Christina Hanna, Program Director for Center for Faith and Work.